that the state had nearly 30 individuals in and around Pearl Harbor on that day. Five of those individuals come from Chapel Hill. Um, Ernest Porter, Earl Roberts, Charles Mann, William Durham, um, and Mike Rubish were all in Pearl Harbor on that day. Their stories are pretty interesting. Four of them died. Now, Mike Rubish, Mr. Rubish just died, passed a couple um, years ago, of Rubish and Certain Insurance Agency. His grandkids went here. Um, so he um, was the only guy who survived, and he was there. He shouldn't even have been there. It's a kind of interesting story. William Durham um, was on deck of the Arizona on the day of the attack, and if the bomb didn't land on him, it landed within a foot of him. And so his grave site is out on Old Lister Road, like going south down towards Pittsburgh. Wow, we got rock stars here. Ooh, all right, so anyway. So Pearl Harbor, um, last week we started the European theater and Adolf Hitler's rise to power and what was going on. Well, the attack on Pearl Harbor really turns World War II into a truly world war. So Andre Harper, you guys need seats? We can get a, Anna Grace has to stand because she's not going to be in this class next week. So anyway, I'll get over that one sooner or later. So anyway, now we went back and talked about Hitler. So you got to understand Japanese history. Japan is just an old traditional empire. And right around the end of the Renaissance, the high Middle Ages in Europe, <coughs> Japan will undergo what is called the national policy of isolation. Where Japanese had gone out to China, Korea, other places, they had learned about the world, and they had created their own unique civilization. And at this point, there was an emperor, but he was a figurehead. He was off doing emperor stuff. The real power lie in a secondary position known as the shogun. And this guy, you know, legendary Tokugawa Iyasu says, you know what? We've assimilated everything that we can from whomever we've talked to. We've adopted it and made it fit Japan. We're good. I don't want any outside interference. So Japan closes themselves off, except for a few Dutch traders and Jesuit missionaries. Japan is off the radar. Nobody goes out and nobody comes in. In effect, it is the European Dark Ages from the fall of Rome until the first Pump <coughs> Crusade. Japan is just existing, and they're doing just fine. Problem is, the world had hit the Industrial Revolution. And if you've ever seen, it's kind of an interesting, but not super accurate, the movie The Last Samurai with Tom Cruise. Okay, all right. It's pretty good, but you kind of get the point. Well, Japan has this culture shock. In 1853, United States Admiral Perry sails into Tokyo Bay, chug, 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 with a steam engine, iron-plated boat belching smoke. The Japanese are like, what is this? Commodore Perry says, hey, we're America, we're late into this imperialism game, but we would really like to trade with you in China. <laughs> Chinese or Japanese are nice in China and Japan. And the Japanese are like, no, get the heck out of here. We don't have anything that you don't have anything that we want. Oh, really? And poof. And he fires off around from the main cannon. It explodes or it blows up a bunch of trees. And deep, deep, deep in Japanese mythology is the concept of dragon. And they're like, whoa, the Americans literally have harnessed a dragon. There it's belching smoke, it's shooting flame. What's going on, guys? It's blowing stuff up. I may need to get some chairs. Let me grab these two um, red chairs. Here's a chair right here. There's chairs in the back. Except for not need to sit together, or it'll be like, you know, we're going to have a wall later. All right. So, uh, they're going, oh my God, these Americans have harnessed the power of a dragon. So the next day, six samurai come down to get the admiral, and they're going to take him to meet the shogun and the emperor. And they say, hey, you're allowed to bring six marine guards with you. He's like, no, I'm okay. And he draws a sidearm, and he fires a couple shots into like a tree. 
They're like, holy crap, the guy's got a small drag, like, you know, from the movie where they've got Mushu wrapped around his hand. They're like, what's going on? And so the, ja the Chinese keep saying Chinese. The Japanese are like, oh my god, we've got to take a hard look in the mirror while we think we've perfected our society, everybody else has grown by leaps and bounds. What are we supposed to do? So this starts about a 50-year period known as the Meiji Restoration, which is an incredible time in Japan where they go from a medieval feudal economy to a modern industrial one in 50 years, faster than anybody else. Now, there's a blueprint from Great Britain and a blueprint from the United States, but the Japanese have the amazing ability to understand we'll sacrifice short-term gain, like collectively, we'll sacrifice short-term gain for long-term result. So we may not get to enjoy it, but our children and our grandchildren will. And so in the next, you know, 30, 40 years, Japan... They send their young men out, like they always have done. They go to study in Germany and in the United States and in Great Britain. They assimilate, you know, industrialization and techniques and lawmaking systems and parliaments and economic ideas. And they bring it all back and they literally flip Japan in 50 years. Now, the problem is that in Japan, you're super proud of yourself. But in the Western world, you're like, well, you're Japan. Like, you know, like, you know, a couple years ago, you guys were running around going, whoa, you got a smoking dragon. And so part of the problem, Japan will undergo this great period of transformation, but nobody really gives them credit. And we're going to, you know, jump ahead here a little bit. And they figure, well, the reason the Europeans are powerful is they went out and just conquered stuff. You know? Africa, Middle East. South America, Southeast Asia. So you know what? Let's do it. But we need to get attention. And you'll see in a second, they attack you know, Korea and part of China. And we're like, okay, good guys. Wow, okay, you beat you know, the Korean Peninsula. Awesome. Whatever. Most people didn't even know where it was. And they're like, okay, if you're not going to give us credit for defeating an Asian opponent, we'll fight a European one. So in 1906... The Imperial Navy attacks the Russian Pacific Fleet on the Kamchatka Peninsula. So if you've ever played Risk, the Kamchatka is way up there in the rain. <laughs> and the Pacific Fleet was like the whaling fleet. The Japanese sunk it and then declared war. And they kind of have this little fracas that is kind of a stalemate. And, you know, Teddy Roosevelt is going to help negotiate the peace settlement. And the Japanese are like, yeah! Look what we did to Russia. The Western world is like, yeah, but it's Russia. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Seriously, it's Russia. They even have boats? Like, we don't even know. Aren't they frozen? All right? And so, literally, so who cares? You know? Present, comrade. Whatever. Okay, nobody knows. All right? And so the main Russian fleet would have had to sail from the Baltic Sea all the way down the Atlantic, around Africa, across the Indian Ocean, and they're like, no, we're not, whatever, like, we don't even care. The Japanese are like, yeah, look what we did. Yeah, but it's, it's Russia, so good for you, but you really haven't fought a prime time um, opponent. And so, World War I is going to happen, and Japan <coughs> watches this, and they had, you'll see in a second, they attacked deeper into Asia, and at the Treaty of Versailles, if you remember from last week, Victor Emmanuel from Italy was there, Clemenceau from France, Woodrow Wilson from the United States, David Lloyd George from England. The only other guy to get a speaking seat at the table is from Japan. It was Prince Konye. He is the little brother of the emperor. And that is significant because to this day, Japan is the only single dynasty in world history. The Yamato emperor who sits on the throne today can directly trace his ancestry back to the first emperor in the 300s BC. So it's like a 2,200 year old monarchy. Unbroken chain, only one in the world ever. So there's this powerful symbolism <coughs> behind the royal family. And while Konye is there, 
he looks at how England and France are hanging out, and he sees Italy doing whatever, and he sees Wilson going, come on, guys, listen, please. We really got to work together. He's like, huh, these two are broke. Italy, we don't know what they're doing. Right. Most people from Italy are now bailing to the United States. And America is angry. So you know what? Well, they're all focused on themselves. Broke. You're dismantled. Hello, hello, hello. Come on in. We're going to go do our own thing. And so here is the archipelago of Japan. Japan in length is about the size of the state of California. All right? And most of the people will live on the coastline because interior-wise, it's very mountainous, very rugged. It's really, really, really difficult. And so Japan says, okay, now is our time. And everybody else is focused on themselves. We can ramp this ahead. We can really get what we need. And the one thing the Japanese don't have you remember back in the 1980s, everyone was like, oh, Japan is going to take over the world, Honda and Toyota and Sony. Well, one thing Japan doesn't have is raw materials for heavy industry. No iron ore, no coal, no bauxite for steel, chemicals, and most importantly, oil. So if you ever want to economically cripple Japan, just don't sell them anything. Right? And that is, in effect, what is about to happen. Um, Japan needs resources, so back in 1895, they began to imperialize. We've built this army. Tom Cruise has trained us, all right? <laughs> all right. So now we're going to take this thing for a spin, and we're going to see what we can do. And they go over to their old ally, Korea. If it wasn't for Korea, Korea gave the um, Japan the ability to make you know, iron and steel, the old Pache dynasty. So they attack the Korean Peninsula, right? Then in 1910, they move a little bit into China, and they look around to see if anybody says anything, and nobody does. As long as we stay away from the southern part, like Shanghai, where all the Europeans are, if we go up north, like Manchuria and Mongolia, nobody's going to say pretty much anything because, number one, nobody really knows where it is. Number two, most people, if they do, don't. Don't to go there or care. So they keep going and they keep going. And so you're going to see this twice. Right now, Japan is here. They're going to get Korea and they're going to get this part right here. By the time we're done tonight, everything in red is going to be controlled by the Empire of Japan. It's like lightning. They're going to build up, build up, build up their power. And when they let it loose, it's like a, it's like a German blitzkrieg, but in, in Asia. So we got to look at China real fast. China at this time, 1911, the River Valley Civilization, the dynastic cycle of China runs for the 31st and the last time. Literally going back to 3000 BC, China has been ruled by dynasties. And now that ends. Nobody really knows what to do. And there's a guy named Sun Yat Sun, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to lead us. And he's old and he gets tired. So he appoints a buddy, yeah. Mr. Chiang Kai-shek. Can you help me out? All right. And in the meantime, World War I is going to happen. And uh, when it's all said and done, Sun Yat Sun says, hey, I need some help modernizing China, like happened in Japan. Can anybody help? Enormous mistake for the Western world. Germany is dismantled. England and France are trying to repair themselves. And the United States has become an isolationist. And China's like, help! Can anybody help? Can anybody help? And nobody would except one country who is always, they're still looking for friends. The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, my little capitalistic here. The, you know, the, the, the Communist Revolution, Lenin, you know, is like, oh, what, who needs a friend? Oh, you know, China, yeah, whoo. And Sun Yat Sun will call the Soviet Union the one true friend of China, simply because nobody else um, would help. So Chiang Kai shek goes to the Soviet Union, He's supposed to be gone for a couple years, he comes back in like four months. They're like, why are you back so soon? He's like, well, it's really not all that hard. Like, I got this. Okay. So what we're going to do. And he begins to mobilize 
little slap of communism. I'll we'll do that a lot. So <laughs> communism, sorry, you're going to hate this. So anyway, all right. So anyhow, all right, doesn't work. So anyhow, great theory. Anyway, so he comes back and he's determined to stop communism in China, which is a whole other weird story, even though he's kind of communist. Um, and this causes an internal civil war. It's Chiang Kai-shek versus Mao Zedong. And while they're fighting, the Japanese are like, this is just way too easy, all right? The Europeans aren't paying attention because they had their war, and now China's fighting themselves. Oh, my God! The only thing we can do is attack to help them because clearly they need our help. So the Japanese invade Manchuria, and they are able to write into an agreement with China that if our economic assets are ever over or ever threatened, we can invade with our army and take over. Great movie. It's epically long. It's Empire of the Sun with John Malkovich, a 12-year-old um, Christian male like Batman who can like really sing when he's 12. Fantastic <laughs> movie, really. Um, how he didn't win an Oscar, I don't know, but in Great Britain they made an, uh, an award at the British Oscars just for him because he was told to rob. But anyway, talks all about this. If our economic interests are threatened, we can militarily invade. And when the Civil War is going on, Japan says, hey, what if like our railroad to our coal mine in Manchuria, let's say there's a lightning storm and it spontaneously combusts and maybe blows up. Why would that happen? Well, clearly, it's the Chinese you know, terrorists doing it, and we can then send in our army and take over more land. Yeah, but the Chinese didn't blow it up. No, we did, but we're going to tell everybody that ch the Chinese, whether it's the communists or Chiang Kai-shek guys, did it. And that's what happens. And China's like, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, you can't do this. And they scream and yell in the League of Nations, and Japan is told by Great Britain and France, you know, you probably shouldn't do that. Shame, shame on you, that's very bad. And Japan said, like, okay, whatever, all right? And Japan will suffer, and they had just about reached the height of their industry, and a massive earthquake hits. Right about the time of the Great Depression, in Germany. All their hard work has to be redone. They need more money, they need more resources, and they need more territory. So in 1936, they will join, they're watching what Hitler is doing, and when nobody stands up to him in Europe, they join the um, uh, Rome to Berlin axis, and they join Nazi Germany in the tripartite, tri tripartite act, excuse me. June 27th, Prince Konye says, Japan will bring about a new world order in Asia. As Germany is going to dominate Europe, Japan, we are going to not um, dominate Asia. And there's, um, let me check, check around real fast. One of the things that had happened, what had gotten the feeble protest, is the, for a long time, denied um, rape of non-king, where some... Foreign soldiers fired upon the imperial Japanese and then fled. Um, supposedly, the citizens of Nanking assisted them. So in reprisal, and there were no military age men there, the Japanese army went in and killed 350,000 individuals. Um, old men, women, and children, some of the things they did will just defy... Um, imagination, do some research, like taking bets on you know the fetus of a pregnant lady's baby and cutting them open and all this stuff. And it hits the news, right? And just a couple years ago, there was the settlement with the Korean, you know, a comfort women. So we'll talk about Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, but this has just been kind of well, it was China and Chiang Kai shek and does anybody on the really know? So this here, the heads of these people hit the newspapers. People now start begin to pay attention, but again, it's it's a whole way in Asia, and that's like really far. Where is Nanking, ancient capital? I don't know. 
And so, what's that? We're such racists. You know, we just, we're, we're just not very bright, right? You know, right? Geographically. That's over there. And it wasn't just the United States, it was England, it was France, it was, you know. And so, Japan at this time, because the national policy of seclusion, as Adolf Hitler was going on with, you know, the Nazi doctrine and the Aryan race, about 99%, there's no really foreign ethnic blood DNA in Japan. And the Japanese felt when the sun came up, the sun goddess, her rays signed, uh, shined on Japan first. So therefore, they're blessed by the sun, their most important god, who has a living representation as the emperor, young emperor Hirohito, at, from the age of a young boy, was brought up, when he would go into the elementary school classroom, everybody, even the teacher, would stand up and like bow. So he's raised to believe that he is a living God, and the Japanese will revive the old samurai code of Bushido. Honor, loyalty, truthfulness, and obedience to the emperor. So this is what um, you know, carries it in. So, problem is, as Japan begins to make their imperial advancement, they start to get close to some British territory and Dutch territory in the Dutch East Indies, where there is a lot of oil. And so knowing that they could get into trouble, Japan looks to their friend. Best friend they have, the United States. Prince Konya and President Roosevelt know each other. They're on a first name basis. And Prince Konya is in the White House having a meeting with President Roosevelt. And Konya says, look, um, we've gotten all the territory we need. We've kind of rebuilt from the earthquake. I know you guys are in the Depression, but we're doing pretty good in Japan. So we're going to stand down. All right, we're going to stand down, and um, we don't have any more territorial gains outside of where we are. This is in late 1938, 1939. We're good. Whatever we have, we're going to stop. It's the exact same thing Adolf Hitler had said about Czechoslovakia. And as they're having this meeting, an aide comes in and whispers in Roosevelt's ear and hands him a message. And Roosevelt says, get out. Konye's like, what? I will not have you come in here and lie right to my face. Mr. President, what's going on? Or Franklin, no, that's Mr. President to you. I will not be lied to. You are a liar, Konye. Get out. And he throws the prince out of the house. The message said, while Konye was saying we have no more territorial gains, the Japanese army had invaded Saigon and it was then French Indochina. Konye is like, what, what, what? But, but I didn't know. Roosevelt's like, number one, you're the emperor's brother. Number two, you're the lead ambassador. Number three, you sit on the Imperial War Council. Don't tell me you didn't know. You're a liar. Now get the hell out of here. And Konye doesn't know what to do. Now, was he a great poker player? Most likely. I don't think you get to his position and not know. He is halfway across the world. But you don't just, we're going to invade French Indochina on a whim. Problem is twofold. Number one, this threat is not only British, but American interests in the Philippines. So Konye is given the boot. And in response, President Roosevelt freezes all Japanese economic assets in the United States in 1940. Also places an embargo of oil on the island nation of Japan as well. Immediately, Great Britain, Canada, and the Netherlands follow suit. There is a kink to the economic flow of Imperial Japan. Well, Komiye is like, man, I don't know. Let me go home and find out what happens. And he flies back to Japan. He figures out what's going on. And he says, hey, Mr. President, why don't we meet in Honolulu to work things out? And Roosevelt doesn't respond. Konye gets a response from a little State Department flunky. 
that says, in order to meet with the president, you've got to go through proper channels. What do you mean, Tom? I'm a member of the royal family. I know it's Franklin. No, 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 no. You have to work with some low-level flunky and work your way. It was a message from Roosevelt saying, I don't trust you. You no longer get to speak directly to me. You've got to stop and talk to this guy. I don't know who he is. We just hired him. This is a deep insult to the royal family. Right? You must be prepared by diplomatic negotiation. To the royal family, Bushido code, we don't lie. It's all about honor. And Roosevelt's like, yeah, but I just, I just don't believe you. I just don't. And so when this is told, hardliners in Japan, and the main guy is a little guy named Hideki Tojo. Hideki Tojo says, no, if the Americans don't listen, we're going to go to war. We're going to draw up three objectives. Number one, that if we negotiate, it will be done. Tokyo will be the only one who draws up provisions of the negotiations. We're like, well, negotiations work by, okay, fine, <laughs> whatever, right? Number two, um, you have until October. Well, that's really not a point, but anyway. And number three, if by October there's no headway, we're going to declare war, all right? We are not afraid to go to war with the uh, United States. This message is sent to Secretary of State Cordell Hall by our main military commander, a guy named by the name of Lieutenant Richard Creswell. And Creswell sends this message. He says, don't be fooled by Japan. Tojo is a conservative. But remember, you cannot assess Japanese logic through a Western mentality. Self-preservation should prevent Japanese from launching a suicide attack on the United States. But mark my words, they'll do it. All right? What you and I think is suicide, they're like, yeah, let's go. All right? <laughs> so you can't assess them through Western. If they say they're going to do it, that means they're going to do it. Don't fall asleep. Keep your eye on them. Well, September, it's not even October, it's 1940. The deadline for the negotiations comes and goes, and nothing has changed. So people are starting to pay attention. Konye decides he needs some help, and he makes a mistake when he summons the Japanese Imperial War Council. To this point, Japan was ruled by a constitutional monarch. Japanese have a constitution. It's really not that good. They took it from Germany, from Otto von Bismarck, where all power goes to the emperor and his shogun, his chief military assistant, and in an homage that Germany put in back to ancient Rome, Article 48, that Hitler used to take power. The Japanese say if there's a time of crisis, the Imperial War Council can throw out the civilian government and they can take over. And the head of the Imperial War Council is Hideki Tojo. When they are legally summoned by Prince Konye, Tojo says, Konye, you're out, but I'm the Emperor's brother. Well, guess what? This is how we are going to roll. And he's asked a question. You've been over there. How long can Japanese... In the Japanese fight, the United States toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And Konye says 18 months to 24 months maximum. Tojo says, I disagree. He's like, no, seriously. All right? Once they get their train on their track, we've got to get everything we want or we can't stop them. Well, you're crazy. They're nothing but mutts. They're not pure blood. They're Italian and Jewish and Mexican and African and Polish and Italian and German and Swedish, like they can't, no, 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 you don't understand. They've got nearly unlimited resources and almost as much unlimited manpower. Week 18 to 24 months at length. You're a coward, you're done, you're fired. Konye, the head ambassador, the emperor's little brother, is gone. The Japanese and the members of the Imperial War Council, honest to God, you can look this up, Admiral Honda, General Toyota, 
Admiral Suzuki, all right, General Kawasaki, and those, it's all true, back at the beginning of, um, you know, in the 1300s, there was a switch in the Japanese economy where everything had to be manufactured for the emperor or your local lord. Another shogun, the first shogun, Minamoto Yoritomo, said, hey, if you make something really good, after you make the quota for the emperor, take the rest and sell it. Well, smart Japanese daimyo, wealthy lords, were smart enough to go out and recruit the very best artisans, the best tailors, the best butchers, candlestick makers, blacksmiths, sword makers, you know it, and they hoarded them. And the guys to do it were the Hondas, the Kawasaki's, the Suzuki's, and the Toyota. They're literally like, you know, almost a thousand year old multinational um, corporations. So they got this. These guys said, you know what, in two years, bring the United States. We'll have everything we want anyway, so it really doesn't matter. So let's do this. And in a last-ditch effort, they send over a new ambassador named Caruso. And Caruso had married an American lady, and he sent to Washington to try and negotiate. He and Roosevelt sit down, and they have a plan. And it looks like we're going to avoid a crisis. I'm going to date myself and the hours of TV that I watch. All right? My sister-in-law thinks that watching TV will give her children eye cancer. And I'm like, Kirsten, my dear, if that were true, my eyeballs would be smoking hollow sockets. So I'm going to date myself. All right? Anybody remember the old TV show Columbo? Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right? oh, yeah. Goofy old Columbo. Everyone thinks he's dumb. Everybody overlooks him. You know, he'd do the thing, okay, you know, uh, you know, thank you, sir. Um, that was all good. And he'll walk out and be like, oh, wait a minute, there is, there's this one, there's this one, one more thing. Right. Well, they got it all penned out. You know, Caruso picks up his stuff. He's walking out, and he's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 Mr. President, what now? Well, there's one more thing. Well, you can't put one more thing in. I already signed it. Yeah, you really can't help out China. Roosevelt's like, what? We gotta stop Mao Zedong. He's a dirty, stinking, you know, commie. All right. My third grade teacher. Boy, this is gonna freak you guys out. He used to wear a tie. This is the 1970s, right? Eat leg, you dirty red. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. You know, we can't trust those dirty, stinking commies. You know, so we've got to help. No, 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 no. In order for this agreement to be valid, you got. He's like, well, then you should have put that in the agreement. You can't be like, oh, we're all done. Oh, wait a minute, Colombo, one more thing. So no. Well, Mr. President, if you don't agree, this thing is no good. And Roosevelt's like, well then, tear it up. I don't care. Just fine. Whatever. So that happens. We intercept the message from the Japanese embassy. It hits Japan, where they say, okay. War is imminent. This is in 1940, all right? Late November, the Imperial War Council votes unanimously, we're going to go to war, but no message is sent to the United States. And they bring in a guy, I, I kind of like him, his name is Admiral Yamamoto. Yamamoto is a real Jedi. It's kind of like almost Rommelish um, from the German army. And Yamamoto was a brilliant guy, educated in the United States, got his MBA from Harvard. He studied shipbuilding in, like, you know, Portland, Maine, in Boston, and in Philadelphia. He studies steel production in Pittsburgh and Buffalo, manufacturing in Cleveland and Detroit, um, airplane manufacturing out in Seattle. He's gone all over the country. And a decade before this, in 1930, here's where it really um, gets good. He's brought in Hiro, or, um, he's, I mean, the Emperor Hirohito. Yamamoto, old boy, what do you think of the United States? He's like, oh man, I really like the U.S. Burgers and fries. All right, that's some good stuff. <laughs> well, what do you think if we have to go to war with the United States? He's like, man, that would be awesome. If Japan and the United States ever really laid, laid into somebody, there's nobody that can stop us. No, 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 no. You misunderstand. What happens if we go to war with the United States? So you mean fight them? What would we do that for? Well, let's just say that we do. He's like, that would be the dumbest thing of all time. 
And they're like, what for? And he's like, because you don't understand. Again, like Konye told, told you guys, the United States, they're in the Great Depression right now. But they don't need to conquer anything to get industrial resources. They already have them. And they've got manpower. If anybody makes them angry, and their industrial production, and their manpower is galvanized and unified, no power on this earth can stop them. Mark my words, they can't be beaten. Don't, we shouldn't do it. And they said, well, great, you're the man for a job, plan the attack. He's like, what? Yeah, since you know so much, you've got to plan the attack. If we're going to go to war with them, what should you do? He said, well, we better summon all the energy we have and strike hard, and that first blow better be a knockout killer blow, because we probably won't get to. And they're like, awesome, plan it. And he's like, no. Now, to be fair, we have a group of guys that are called Games and Theory Specialists. They're in little think tanks and little nondescript places. And their job is to, like, think this stuff up. If we have to invade every country in the world, even our own, if there's an alien invasion, literally, we got a plan for it, all right? It's better to have one and not need one than be, like, making this stuff up, like, you know, kind of cowboying it. So he's like, okay, we're serious. So Yamamoto <coughs> will build a replica of the Pearl Harbor naval base way up on the northern end of China, nor north of Honshu Bay in this remote area where there nobody's there. And he builds little dummy you know, battleships and the whole layout. He brings in pilots and bombardiers and navigators, and he runs them through just a ridiculous array of tests. Daytime, nighttime, stay awake for three days, all right? Give them um, uh, a sleeping medication, rain, sun, snow, sleet, hail. And every pilot and every bomber was given a ship-specific target. This is your target. You had to hit that thing nine out of ten times, over 90% in all weather, or you were gone. He says, we're going to get one shot at this. i got to take the very best of the very best. Because if we don't, we're going to lose. So I make the, um, the equivalent of, these are Japanese Top Gun pilots. Right? This is Maverick and Goose and Iceman. <laughs> They're going out, all right? We got to take everything we have or we are in a lot of trouble. So time goes by, and on December the 6th, we decode a message that the Japanese have achieved 13 of our 14 points against the United States. Point 14 is go to war. The code name is Climb Mount Nataka. That is issued on um, November the 26th, 1941. War is on. Now, when it takes off, all right, war is coming. Roosevelt will know about 1 o'clock in the morning, or 1 o'clock p.m., six hours after the attack is going to happen. Now, to go back to this, as early as 1923, very obnoxious, loud, love him or hate him general named George Patton was in Pearl Harbor. And he looks around and says, where are the anti-aircraft guns? Well, what do we need anti-aircraft guns for? Well, in clay's planes, how many? Well, where are they going to come from? <laughs> you know, who knows? We got to have them. Where are your anti-ship batteries? Well, we got one up, like in the Diamond Head on the volcano. You got one? Well, what are you going to do if we're invaded? Well, who's going to invade us? We're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, for the love of God. Why are all of your airplanes, you know, wing to wing? Well, because we hear the Japanese got saboteurs out here, the fifth column, and if we bunch them up all together, they're easier to protect. He's like, or, stupid, <laughs> did you ever not hear of a thing known as the Spanish Armada, where they all tied their boats together, and little Sir Francis Drake came by in a storm, and the Spanish ceased to be a superpower in Europe. So we might want to spread them out. Oh, no, 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 no. He's like, oh, my God. And then he looks across to Pearl Harbor, and the boats are tied up, you know, bow stern, bow stern. He's like, what in God's name? And he screams and cries so much he gets fired. 
March 31st, 1941, Hugh Drum and Ed Markham, one Navy Rear Admiral, one General, are sent to do a threat assessment at Pearl Harbor. And it's like they took Patton's record and just changed the date. They go, do we have any defenses? Why are you doing this? Well, the fifth column is here. Well, spread your stuff out. So nothing was done, even though as far back as 1923 in March of 41, people are saying, this, we are not ready down here. Husband Kimmel, the admiral, you got to be ready. And so here is Admiral Yamamoto. I got a little bit ahead of myself. Japanese are no longer defending. They're going on the attack. And the attack simply was, we've got to hit them as hard as we can, at the initial outset of the war, or we are going to lose. And some of the things they find, um, Pearl Harbor is shallow. It's only about 30 or 45 feet deep. So at the time when you dropped a torpedo from a plane, it would sink underneath the water, you know, 60, 70, 80 feet. And as it went down and came back up, the change in pressure would activate the explosive device. It would arm the warhead. Well, if they did that with the technology they had, it would stick in the bottom of the harbor and blow up. So they've got to find a way for the torpedo to drop to arm itself, but not go below like 10 to 20 feet. And they try and they try and they try, and they finally figure out that they build a balsa wood fin around the torpedo, like the little airplanes we used to have with a little rubber band. The Japanese spend seven to eight years developing technology specifically for Pearl Harbor. Other thing, yeah. Other thing they had to do was if we drop one of our aerial bombs too low and it hits like one of the steel, you know, gun turrets, it'll just bounce off. It might, might scratch some paint, but it's not going to do anything. If we drop it too high, all right. If we hit a certain part of the deck, it may go straight through and land in the harbor. So we've got to find the sweet spot and the right size of warhead to do maximum damage. And it takes 10 years to figure all of this stuff out. Well, on November, six brand spanking new aircraft carriers, the Kagi, the Akaga, the Shukaku, the Sukaku, all the big ones that are going to be at Midway, head out across the... Um, Pacific in one of the most brilliantly conceived, you know, attack plans of all time. It's almost flawlessly executed. As they go, they take just a very small number of battleships and submarines and supply frigates. They want to go really small, right, so they're unnoticed. They go way, 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 way up in the 43rd parallel in the middle of nowhere. It's not in the, in the, the shipping <coughs> lanes. And all of a sudden, the Japanese feel victory coming. This storm blows up, a kamikaze, a divine wind. Now, way back in the 1200s, 1274 and 1281, Kublai Khan had taken over everything else, and he wanted to conquer Japan. Now, if the Mongols set their feet on the ground in Japan, Japan is done. And he sends 150,000 soldiers into the Japanese... The divine emperor went down to the beach and he started going like this and moving and shaking and all of a sudden the waves began to grow, the boats began to rock and bam, the divine emperor whipped up a hurricane, a divine wind, and destroyed Kublai Khan's fleet. Like that Ang that Airbender kid, all right, whatever he's like doing all his little mojo, all right. So Kublai Khan's like, oh, shenanigans. <laughs> Never been defeated before, I'll show them. I'll send a bigger invasion in 1281. And because he's Kublai Khan, I'm going to send it on about the exact same date as I did seven years ago, October. And he sends 180,000 soldiers. And the emperor starts going like this and whipping it up. And honestly, God, another hurricane comes and bam, sinks that fleet. Kublai Khan's like, well, Japan's good. <laughs> All right, All right. You know, yeah. All right, knock the sake out of me, guys. So you're good. So whatever. So he's like, okay, I'm done. So when this hurricane blows up, the Japanese are like, yes, it's the divine emperor. And it runs just north and 
um, east of the invasion force. It's a screen, it's a shield, it's a blocker. And they swoop down by San Francisco, and the Japanese attack submarine sinks two boats coming out of San Francisco. Machine guns, the guys, it was a freighter with lumber headed for Pearl Harbor. But before a distress signal could be given, everybody was killed. And on the night of December 6th, 1941, about 230, 250 miles north of the island of Oahu, the Japanese armada has arrived undetected. Huge problems with this. For almost two weeks, remember we're in the middle of the Pacific, no one's going to get us, the Japanese Navy went radio silent. If you have an opposing Navy that goes radio silent, you don't go radio silent unless you're up to something. Find them. Where are they? What's going on? I don't know. They're around here. Surely we would see them. Go get a Mai Tai and find Thomas Magnum in TC and take a ride in the, on that helicopter. So, anyway, I love my Mai Tais. So, here we are. And brilliantly, and you'll see this in a second here, um, here's their, their little rod. I've got to get to my map. All right, if you will go back. If you look at Pearl Harbor on the south end of the island, it's a trident, it's three fingers. Well, two aircraft carriers were parked at the end of each finger. And so as the planes swept around the island, the mountains, and they dropped their payload, the finger of the harbor pointed them right back to where their aircraft carrier was. So your flight time to return was minimized. There were going to be three attacks. First wave is going to drop their payload, and they're going to head back. And as they're heading back, the second flight is going to take off, clean up anything they missed, the first wing, wing is going to refuel, rearm, come back up and blow up an, an oil field. That way we're in the air as little as possible. We can do our damage and then get out of there. Brilliantly, brilliantly um, conceived. And so the planning for the attack was made for early on Sunday morning. And Vice Admiral Chichi Nagumo says... This is going to be the Waterloo of the war to follow. Here is where Japan proves themselves to the world, and the United States is knocked out. And so, here's where conspiracy theorists will um, come in. Sunday morning, um, everybody's asleep in, in their berths. And what happened, the Navy would leave early Monday morning, go out and do maneuvers, and they'd come back in Friday night. Friday night, two-thirds of the guys were given shortly. They could go to the bars, see a movie, find their girlfriends, get drunk, whatever. And a third of the guys stay on the ships. Sunday, they would be prepped and cleaned and refueled to head back out Monday morning. So Sunday was kind of like an off day. Um, the different battleships, different church services were performed. Methodist on the California, Catholic on the Tennessee... Baptist on the Nevada. So, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, what, get sleep in, sleep off your hangover, um, whatever. But the three big aircraft carriers we have, the Enterprise, the Hornet, and the Yorktown, left Saturday night. And the problem with that for the Oliver Stone folks out there is an aircraft carrier is a very expensive piece of equipment. It's huge. Number one, the ship itself is expensive. But on board are a bunch of airplanes, which are also expensive, and highly trained pilots. Toughest thing in the world to do is land and take off a plane off of a moving aircraft carrier at sea. It's extremely difficult. To that end, next week, I'm going to just break for a minute. Um, we talk about it. Next week is Doolittle's Raid in Midway. Um, last night, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Cole, um, I was 103 years old died. He was the last surviving member of Doolittle's Raiders. He was 103. So, wow. But 103, my man, had a really good ride. When you hear about what he did, like one of the bravest things of, of all time. So, anyway, these aircraft carriers and their flight crew mechanics and their pilots never, ever, ever go out to sea without an escort of battleships, destroyers, submarines. Because if you lose one, you're in bad shape. All three sail out of Pearl Harbor and they scatter. One goes straight south, 
One goes over towards Chile, and the other one goes like straight east over towards like you know Mexico, Baja Peninsula, you know Central America. They're they're just gone. So that's the first objective for Yamamoto's guys: get those um, aircraft carriers. Well, at 5:30, the pilots are awoken, and they're prepped. And as they go out to their planes, just the pilots, they go into a room that was decorated with a shrine for the emperor. And they were given a headband that said, your life for the emperor. And they put their headband on. No matter what happens, the emperor says, you are blessed, go for it. It's like the pope given a plenary indulgence in, in the crusades. Once I got this on, everything I do is for the emperor. So best thing I can do is blow up a bunch of Americans. Worst case scenario, if I get hit, fly my plane into the nearest target I can, because if I give my life for the emperor, I go right to Shinto heaven. So they take a drink of sake, they say a little prayer, they get in their plane, and off they go. 214 planes in the first attack. An hour later, this is where it gets interesting, um, two guys, two young privates, spot them, on what is known as the Opana Radar Station. It's way up on the North Shore where all the surfing takes place, where that old show Lost um, was filmed. And the two guys, um, one of them just died, uh, they see this formation um, uh, coming in. And they call their lieutenant, hey, um, uh, LT, what's going on? Well, look, man, uh, we see these planes, there's a big blip on the radar, is really not all that good, but, you know, we see this blip, what's going on, you know, we think we need to tell somebody. The lieutenant was playing chess with a buddy over on um, Kailua, and he looks at his thing, oh, there's a flight of B-17s um, coming in. Um, the main guy, you know, coming in from, from this San Diego, um, the main guy talking was Joe Lockhart. Joe, um, just recently died, and to his dying day, he said, look, we knew this was coming. We could have given the soldiers, the sailors, the Marines at least 45 minutes warning. Ed and Joe both say this, but their lieutenant said, no, nah, don't worry about it. You guys are dismissed. You're done for the day. Now, B-17s arriving at 7 o'clock in the morning simply wouldn't happen. Because in order for B-17s to get to Honolulu at that time in the morning means they would have had to take it off around midnight back in San Diego. B-17 is a big plane. It's very expensive. It's got a crew of 11. And they have a compass, but you're at night over the Pacific where there's really no depth perception, the dark horizon, and the water. If your navigator or your compass, compass is just a degree off, you're in the middle of nowhere, all right? And just a tiny degree. And the islands, you know, so you, know, you, you can see them, you got a little better shot. So there's no way they would have flown through the darkness to get there that early. More likely, they were taken off at 7 a.m., and they would get in Honolulu about 1 or 2. So this was just common sense. B-17s aren't going to be coming in right now. All right? And Ed and Joe were just fanatical about this um, for all of their lives. So no one believed them. The fleet is asleep. Guys are waking up. Flags were being raised on the U.S. Tennessee, and the Navy band was playing the Star Spangled Banner. And all of a sudden, at 7.53, out of nowhere, the planes hit. And what the Japanese do in the middle of Honolulu is what's known as the Koli Koli Pass. So the big dull pineapple plantation now. On either side of it, the mountains swing out. Think of like Pearl Harbor as like a, a catcher's baseball bit. And you swing out around the mountains, and as you come up, from south to north, you fly right up the mouth of the channel, while the mountains screened not only the planes, but their noise. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, 
come these planes screaming out the harbor. Now, the Army and the Navy used to, like, you know, buzz each other, just, you know, the old, old Army-Navy Navy rivalry. Um, Major General William Short and husband Kimmel were out. They skipped church that day, and they were going to play golf. They were at 7 a.m. They were, you know, they had teed off. They were on hole number three, and like, oh, crap, we are in trouble. What just happened? We are being attacked. So there are two messages at 7.53. Number one, by um, Chichi Nagumo, says, Torah, 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 tiger, 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 attack, attack, attack. Surprise successful. We've done it. We've got it. Rear Admiral Patrick Bellinger says, Air Raid, this is no drill. All hands man your battle stations. Guys are like, what? An explosion starts to happen. Guys who did get to their battle stations, honest to God, had nothing to fight with. Since we were not at war, there were no live ammunition in the machine guns, in the anti-aircraft guns, mm -hmm. on the ship's cannons. We could, like, spit at them and, like, curse at them, but that was, you know, M1s maybe, but, like... What's that going to do? So primary target are the aircraft carriers. They're not there. Secondary target are the eight battleships along Battleship Row, and then the airfields. Wheeler Airfield, Kaneohe Bay, a Marine Airfield, Hickam, um, and Hickam Airfield. So here's my local story. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Mike Rubish um, was town was good baseball player. And was going to go to UNC to play baseball, but instead he decides to sign up for the Army first. And was in the Philippines. And he was there with a guy named um, Archie Graham. Now, we all know Archie Graham, but you don't really know you know Archie Graham. we all seen Field of Dreams, Kevin Costner movie. There's a little kid they pick up alongside the road, and they take him, and he's the doctor, and he has Kevin Costner's daughter, and she's choking on the hot dog. That's Archie Graham. Anybody know where Archie Graham is from? Chapel Hill. Hill. Chapel Hill. <laughs> Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill. Frank Porter Graham is his brother. All right. So Archie Graham, Mike Rubish, and Joe DiMaggio's little brother are in the Philippines. And they're on the baseball team because they're all really good. And they're playing against the Navy team. And you got big Doug MacArthur going, man, the Army baseball team is the best freaking baseball team in the service. Ah. Chester Arthur Nimitz, whatever, the Navy baseball team is the very best in the service. So the two guys have an argument, and they decide to play a three-game, winner-take-all, Army-Navy tournament in Pearl Harbor on Christmas Day. So Rubish and Manning and DiMaggio are like, guys, come here, what? We're putting you on this plane, where are we going? Where are you going to Guam? Then you're going to Hawaii, what for? Where are you going to play baseball? Okay. So they get on a plane, and they land at Hickam Airfield. And there's a guy waiting for him. I go, okay, what is our detail while we're here? Well, you're going to practice baseball. Well, yeah, but what else is our detail? Well, you don't get it. General MacArthur does not want to lose. You guys are to practice baseball. <laughs> what else? I don't know. Play catch? So wait. We're in the Army. We're in Paradise. And all we got to do is play baseball, which we're pretty good at. And then we can go to the beach and get Mai Tais and do whatever. Yeah. This is going to be awesome. They're super pumped. Anybody guess when they arrived at Pearl Harbor? Yeah. Yeah. Hickam Airfield, December 8th, or excuse me, December 6th at 10 p.m. Oh, my God. So they were there for nine hours. All right. So needless to say, they never got to play their baseball. So, like, this is going to be great. Actually, no, fellas, it's not. So, on deck of the Arizona is William Durham. William Durham, oh, I have 21 minutes. Okay, here we go. All right, that background stuff took away. No more of that background stuff. Next week, we're just blowing stuff up next week. All right. All right. Battleship is going to have three 16 inch, um, set, three sets, four sets of three guns, 12 guns. 16 inch gun shoots a 16 inch. Projectile weighs about 2,000 pounds, high explosive shell, about 23 miles. So if we parked one here in the high school parking lot, we could fire, in effect, a Volkswagen Beetle and blow up the runway at RDU. Massively 
powerful things. Inside is a giant hunk of steel. If you're in there, good luck getting to you. Well, on deck, right next to Turner.